oh gosh, but that was the main one. Setting up routines has been wicked difficult too. Uh, routines would be excellent for O and and mice too and the tinies, but getting into the swing of routines has just been brutal because it's two households. It's a house kind of shifts in the of kind of like avoid the bad moments strategy, which isn't necessarily like that's some OTs have suggested that, like just make sure the meltdowns don't happen. Do whatever you've got to do to make sure the meltdowns don't happen. But for me at my house, I don't have the same options that he does because there's there's three other kids. So we have to work through the meltdowns. So there's such a difference between the two households, even just a routine of like my therapist and I were talking about this, like, okay, we get up and then we do breakfast and then we do getting dressed. And then we do, even that's been kind of hard to figure out amongst the four of us and myself. And of course, I'm the last one to get any kind of routine established, like period. Yeah. Another thing that I like is I don't know if this is possible in your scenario. And a lot of these things aren't always possible in all scenarios. There's, There's always outliers. But I listened to a great podcast lately with a friend of mine. His name's Kyle Kingsbury, and he has a great podcast, and he was on the hunting trip with me. He's a a UFC fighter and all these things. But um, Kyle was explaining, there's this interesting thing that we've done in modern society where parents and kids' routines kind of happen alongside each other, but not really. It's the same way that like dad might have eggs and kid has cereal or dad's drinking coffee and reading the newspaper while the kid is doing something, I'm actually a really firm believer of trying to get your kids involved in grown up routines as much as you can. I really like the idea of parents trying to meditate with their kids with the knowing that nine times out of 10, it's not going to work. The kid's going to squirm, the kid's going to go crazy, whatever. You could say it's like pretend nap time where you just lay in bed together and have some (laughs) quiet time or someone doing a yoga practice and knowing that the first hundred times you do it, you're not really going to be practicing yoga. You're just going to be wrangling the kids while you try to show them what a yoga move looks like. The more you do this, the more you normalize your own routine and let your kids see it. There's this strange thing that parents do where they take care of all the kids' needs and then they hope the kid goes and behaves and sleeps and be and is quiet so they can go do all their grown-up stuff. I really think there's an act of normalizing the grown-up stuff in front of the kids and having the kids practice it with you. I think this is very, very powerful stuff. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. My brain is just kind of screwing up how to, how to apply that, but I'm, sure. I'm sure I can figure. Well, and with, out. with the understanding that it will be wildly challenging in the beginning, trying to get any kid, yeah. kids, your age, any child to like do yoga with you. Every single time I wake up at mommy's house, I do this weird yoga yeah. thing. She makes me do this weird yoga thing. <laughs> and eventually they're just going to give in and they're going to touch their toes and they're going to do down dog with you. Like, okay, we're this is this is mommy's weird stretching stuff that we do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they look for, for points of connection too because they're nonverbal. So they really look for like where they're playing, quote unquote, like your game with you. So that's actually really great advice. Exactly. But there's a, a tendency to try to mimic and stuff too. Yes. So, yeah. And another strange thing that parents do that I see is it's like if you give your kid a crayon and coloring book and you don't color with them, that's very strange to me. I don't, I don't understand these things. I always... <laughs> Yeah, and like people in my life get pissed at me if I ever point it out, but I'm just like, how come you don't like do things with your kids? Everybody is always trying to give their kids things to do. And then everyone is trying to do the things that they want to do. And those two worlds very rarely intersect. And I don't understand it. That's so interesting because my situation is so different. If I gave my kid, even though they're three and a half, like crayons, they would eat them. So I have to like hyper supervise everything and like be a part of it. Just, you know, prevent toxicity stuff from happening. My situation is just a little bit different, but it's prevented me from kind of parenting in that traditional way all of the time. Like we know when I'm working with you that there are certain days I just can't touch COVID stuff mm-hmm. because I've got all four kids and it just doesn't work. So I guess I'm lucky in that regard. I have a little bit different look at it. Yeah. but And those are just realities, right? There's always going to be realities of parenting that's like, yeah, no day is going to go perfectly according to plan. And then there's also, yeah, Justin can say, hey, we're going to color, but my kid would eat crayons, but we could come up with a hundred different activities that are less likely for something like eating crayons to happen. I'm just using one very Oh, no, yeah. No, no, no. They love the crayons and they love doing it with me. Like, I almost prefer that, like, he does hand over hand with coloring. Yeah, just being a part of these activities with them. Yes, exactly. Overall, that's it's the, it's the separation of grown-up activities and child activities that I think cause a lot of problems because if you think about that from the standpoint of a child, 
right? I always tell parents that their words and their actions paint reality. They are literally the paintbrush that paint reality for their children. So it is this constant thing where your child, in most cases, the child is going to start to understand that mommy and daddy do a really good job of trying to distract me so they don't have to be with me. So that's why I try to get most parents to really participate in what they're doing with their kids, which is why, and I know it's, this is just a reality of modern parenting of like the handoff of the iPad. Like I need to give this kid the iPad so he can be alone and quiet for 45 minutes so I can get things done. There's absolutely a reality to that. I totally understand it. But there is a psychological aspect of this kid, especially as they get older, realizing this handoff of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, here, kid, do this oh, thing. Yeah. Here, kid, do this no, thing. No, I can remember that from my childhood. Yeah, exactly. when my parents were in eight and they were like, How just go be quiet and, and watch TV. That's fine with us. And so that's what I remember. I have tons of memories of that from childhood. Yeah, my, my mom and her friends, I overheard them when I was very young talking about me because I would go in my room and play with action figures and I would stay there for hours because I had a very vivid imagination and I would never, I wouldn't come out, I wouldn't ask for anything. And I remember hearing my mom and all her friends talk about how my mom basically won the lottery because I would go off and be alone and wouldn't annoy her for hours at a time. So of course it was programmed in my head and it's, it's, it's no accident that now I'm an adult and I have a very hard time accepting help or asking for help from anybody. I was, I was programmed that you know, good little boys can, can be with themselves for hours and never ask for anything and they're loved more for it, you know? No, I totally get that. Well, in my house, you know, if you're quiet and you're, and you're non-challenging, that's when you are the most worthy of love. Yes, so yes. Exactly. So that's, I hope that, that people listening at least got this, got that out of that. It's like the more you can let your kid, you know, like, Hey, I want you to do this activity and I'm also going to do it with you because I love doing things with you. That's just amazing. You know, that's, that's the way to do totally. it. And with the, the, the boys both struggle with play. So people who are listening, they don't know my kids, but my kids have um, developmental delays. So as a way to encourage play, it's, the way that a lot of OTs have asked us to do it is to go ahead and play with the Legos or whatever it is and act like they're the coolest thing we've ever seen. Genuinely take joy in playing with the Legos and then the boys will mimic us. And then as they learn to play with the Legos and they really enjoy playing with the Legos themselves too. And while that's like something that's going on with, with me personally, I think it's also applicable to you know, the nutrition aspect of things and the routine aspect of things too, like we're talking about because how many times does your kid pull stuff off your plate or even with your nieces and nephews, you know, like how many times do they want to eat what's on your plate? They want to be so involved with us. I forget sometimes that they really just want to be all up in everything with you. If you'll allow them to. Yeah. Mo- most human learning, the most significant form of human learning is mimicry. So it's, it's, that's mm-hmm. just the way that it is. So it's like, if my child sees me exercise every day, whether we're busy or not, or they're throwing a tantrum or not, I'm just, my exercise is non-negotiable. I magically raise mm-hmm. a child who exercises. I magically raise mm-hmm. a child who eats Clovis or like my, my nephew, Jackson. I don't even see Jackson all that much. I mean, I maybe see him once a week and regularly my dad will be with him and my dad will send me a text that says, Jackson wanted me to send this video of him doing push-ups." Cause he knows that uncle oh. Justin is a fit guy and he wants to share that with uncle Justin, you know? Oh, do you just die? That's oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. It makes my heart so happy. <laughs> yeah. These, these kids are just little balls of love and they just want you to participate. That's it. They want to do what you do. If you want to raise healthy kids, you just be a healthy person. That's it. And, uh, and Michelle is commenting here and it's great. And we're talking about the cinnamon roll thing too. Like Michelle is saying when her family doesn't eat Clovis when they rarely don't eat Clovis, there's no guilt or shame on the back end. Think about if every single time you let your kid eat a snack that's not Clovis, you go, I can't believe we did that. You're going to feel like crap tomorrow. That was toxic poison. You shouldn't have eaten that. We're going to do a family fast for 24 hours tomorrow. Like, could you imagine if you did that? If you put your kids through that? No, my worst fear is shaming them into anything. Yeah. Literally my worst fear. So think about it. If your worst fear is shaming them, you can't shame yourself. Yeah. Well, I want to sh- thank you for so much for doing this and thank you for being open and vulnerable. And Jackie and I have been having this conversation a lot of, of how meaningful it is to just leave with vulnerability and, and people are commenting right now. I'm sure you can see it, that this is a 
very valuable conversation. Yeah. So thank you so much for being so honest and open with everybody. No, I hope so. I, I love being on this journey with everybody in here. So it's, it's important that we all grow together. Mm-hmm.